So, we just chanted the Sandokai, the great poem by Shitu. Um, there is, of course, a context to this poem, and I will start with the context, and then we will go through uh, couplet by couplet. And as I said, I'll be using the Soto Shu translation. There's tons of translations, but the one I'll be using is a Soto Shu. Um, so the context is this, that supposedly Huinang, the sixth ancestor, got transmission from the fifth ancestor instead of the head monk, whose name I'm blocking, getting transmission from the fifth ancestor. And, that, and then Huinang went into hiding, and then eventually he emerged. And so um, uh, Chan practice in China broke into these two schools, the Southern school, which is Huinang, and that's the school of um, sudden enlightenment, sudden awakening, and then the Northern school, which is more academic and gradual awakening. And that's the story. And of course, we're told the story because um, of uh, Huinang's student, who's the one who actually wrote the Platform Sutra, the Sutra of Huinang. And this was in part a political act to impress the emperor. It's interesting because all of these amazing things, the Heart Sutra, the, um, the uh, uh, Sutra of uh, Huinang, the Sandokai, the Harmony of Difference and Equality, um, many and many others, they all have a kind of political context. And by political, I mean, you're trying to convince somebody to thank you, as Brad has a link for us, you're trying to convince somebody that your way is correct, and their way is not correct. And yet, these texts have amazing teaching in them, because of course, what they're doing is they're expressing this amazing teaching. And they're expressing this amazing teaching because they feel they have to because there are other people giving other teachings. So that's sort of the general kind of way that these things arise. So supposedly you have this northern school and the southern school, and supposedly you have this lineage coming from Huinang, part of which goes to Matsu, we're in Matsu's lineage, and part of which goes to Shitu. And then, so Matsu, you eventually get Lin Shi, and Lin, well, it's like grandson or something, very quickly get Lin Shi, and then um, it goes, what, Matsu, Huangbo, Lin Shi, I believe, and then you, um, so you get the Lin Shi school, which is Shogei school, Korean is part of that, and then you get Shi Tu, leading eventually to the Soto school. So, in fact, I have a lineage chart here, which I am going to Oh, I don't have it. Never mind. I had a cute little lineage chart to put up, but oh, you don't need it. So the idea is that um, you start with the northern versus the southern school. The southern school wins, and then that splits into, in fact, many schools, because later you have five schools, three of which die out. So this, so in the time of Shi Tu, you had this supposed northern and southern school. There are actually some questions about this. There are questions whether Shi Tu ever really did meet Huinang. There's questions of whether Matsu, at Matsu's teacher, ever really was part of Huinang's circle. Um, so modern scholarship says, well, you had this northern and southern split, which wasn't as big a split as people make it out to be. And meanwhile, in the northwest, see, from your point of view, in the northwest, you have um, Matsu, and in the southeast, you have Shi Tu, and they were contemporaries. We don't exactly know uh, Shi Tu's dates. They're conventionally given as 700 to 790, but that's sort of, you know, approximate. But he was living at the time of Matsu. And what's amazing to me is, you know, they, um, they were very respectful of each other. They're shared students and so on and so forth. If you think about it, they're like, what, a thousand, two thousand miles apart? You know, people in those days, man, they think nothing. You you know, put your little sack on your back and you walk like, you know, a thousand miles to meet a teacher. I mean, you know, we complain about like, you know, a plane ride where you have to change planes and, oh, God, you know, you're traveling for six hours. And these people, you know, they they just, they were amazing. I mean, they were so dedicated. They Well, you had to do that to do anything, right? You had to walk or ride a camel or something. And, you know, it was... 
But anyway, Shitu and Matsu were not opposed to each other. They were at the time there were there were these differences were really not that apparent. What later becomes very different. At that time they were not that different. So what Shitu is responding to in this poem is the idea that you have a northern and a southern school. That there that there are these very important differences that one is right and the other is wrong and that you have to hold on to your idea of which is correct so that's what that's where this comes from okay so that's the background um the sandokai um that's the japanese pronunciation but it's not a bad approximation of the chinese so this is very interesting the title is very interesting so san means multiple and if you look at, uh, if you had looked at the characters, the, the characters are given in what I uh, put on the line. So san means multiple, and um, do means one, and then kai means like relationship, harmony, coming together. So there are many different translations in English of the sun of this title, sando kai, but it's the multiple things, the one thing coming together. And the poem is transmuted with the relative and the absolute. So light is the relative, um, dark is the absolute, that's the image that's used. And, but they're not separate, you know, two sides of a coin, two sides of a hand, they, they come together. So the, this is, is basic, um, it's a basic Buddhist teaching that the Absolute is the um, is the is the um, essence is not a good word. The absolute is the substance. The absolute is the substance of the relative. The relative is the expression of the absolute. So that's where this is coming from, and this is very very much the the sort of theme of this is the relationship, the harmony between the absolute and the relative between the difference or multiplicity and equality or oneness. So so the first two lines are the minds of the great sage of India is intimately transmitted from west to east. And the great sage of India, of course, is Buddha. So the mind of the great sage of India is intimately transmitted from west to east. So at the time this poem was written, it was already about over 1500 years since the time of the Buddha. But this mind, this Buddha mind is intimately transmitted. It's not passed down like, you know, I'm going to give Malak a marble and he's going to give it to Shemek and Shemek's going to give it to Joanna and Joanna's going to give it to Liz. This mind is not separate from our mind, intimately transmitted. So the mind of the great sage of India is intimately transmitted from west to east, from India to China. While human faculties are sharp or dull, the way has no northern or southern ancestors. So this is this sort of political context of the northern and the southern schools. And it's interesting, while human faculties are sharp or dull, so I don't get to say, Call you're so stupid. I'm so smart. I know it's right. You don't know it's right. No. <laughs> you know, human faculties are sharp or dull. Doesn't matter. The way has no northern or southern ancestors. You don't get to say, I know. You don't. No. Human faculties sharp or dull. Doesn't matter. That's just your idea. But the way is only the way. There's no northern ancestors, no southern ancestors to differentiate. The spiritual source shines clear in the light. The branching streams flow on in the dark. And this branching streams flow on, this is the first of many wonderful images. So the spiritual source, that's the absolute, it shines clear in the light. That means the absolute is the substance of everything that we see, everything that we differentiate, all these multiple, multiple, multiple things, the spiritual source shines through that. 
And then all this multiple, multiple things come together. The branching streams flow on in the dark. So the relative, all this multiplicity, is simply the expression of the absolute. So grasping at things is surely delusion. So grasping at things means trying to hold on, right? Trying to hold on to our ideas, trying to hold on to our feelings, trying to hold on to our opinions. Grasping at things is surely delusion. But saying, I am in samadhi, all is one, only the absolute has meaning, according with sameness, is still not enlightenment. The relative and the absolute cannot be separated. All the objects of the senses transpose and do not transpose. So we see everything around us and things are constantly changing, just constantly changing. All the objects of the senses transpose, but they don't transpose. Their essence always remains the same. So all the objects of the senses transpose and do not transpose. Transposing, they are linked together. Things morph into each other. Everything is changing. Not transposing, each keeps its place. Sights vary in quality and form. Sounds differ as pleasing or harsh. Yeah, that's right. You know, sometimes things are red. Sometimes things are blue. Sometimes it's foggy. Sometimes the sun is out. Sounds can sound good. They can sound bad. They can be high. They can be low. So sounds differ as pleasing or harsh. Darkness merges refined and common words. So we have all these words that separate things. And some of them we say, oh, beautiful speech. And some we say, oh, not such good speech, you know. But in the absolute, there's no difference. They're all words. And brightness distinguishes clear and murky phrases. So in the relative, we get to say, yeah, yeah, that's good speech. And oh, that's not such good speech. So darkness merges, refined and common words. Language just sort of disappears. But brightness distinguishes clear and murky phrases. The four elements return to their natures just as a child returns to its mother. That's, again, these wonderful images in this poem, right? The four elements return to the, their nature. So earth, air, fire, water. Those are the four fundamental elements of all ancient societies that I know of, certainly. So these four elements, earth, air, water, fire, they return to their natures. Their natures are not distinct. Their natures are not different. They return to their natures just as a child turns to its mother. What is their function? Fire heats, wind moves, water wets, earth is solid, unless you're in an earthquake. All right, so what is their function? Fire heats, wind moves, water wets, earth is solid. Eyes and sights, ears and sound, nose and smells, tongue and tastes. Thus for each and everything, according to the roots, the leaves spread. So this word roots, this is the um, Abhidharma notion of the, the, um, the sense, sensory consciousness is the roots. So this is the roots of our experience. So the roots of our experience are the eye seeing, the ear hearing, the nose smelling, the tongue tasting. They're leaving out the skin feeling. They're leaving that out like I'm aware that this hand is touching this hand. Um, so thus for each and everything according to the roots, so the roots of our experience is the seeing, hearing, and so on, the leaves spread forth. So action comes from this. Trunk and branches share the essence. Revered and common, each has its speech. So 
this fundamental root of experience expresses itself by action. The trunk and branches share the essence, the same Buddha nature behind it. Revered and common, each has its speech. In the light, there is darkness. In the relative, there is the absolute. But don't take it as darkness. Don't take the absolute and make it like a thing. In the dark, there is light. But don't see it as light. So don't hold on to the phenomenal world. Don't on, hold on to the relative world either. Don't hold on to the absolute. Don't hold on to the relative. Light and dark oppose one another like the front and the back foot and walking. And this is another wonderful image, you know. They oppose each other, but they're also working together, the front and the back foot and walking. So light and dark oppose one another like the front and back foot in walking. Each of the myriad things has its merit expressed according to function and place. So everyone has their job to do. Every object has its job to do. Don't have to do everything all at once. Just every person has their job. Every object has its job. Everything has its job. Each of the myriad things has its merit. And it's expressed according to function in place. So in a, any kind of situation, one person has one function, another person has another function, and so on. My glass of water has a function. My watch has a function, and so on. So each of the myriad things has its merit expressed according to function and place. Existing phenomenally, and of course that doesn't mean, oh, it's phenomenal, it means it is a phenomenon, right? Existing phenomenally, like box and cover joining. That's such a great image, like box and cover joining. According with principle, like arrow points meeting. Two fact, fantastic images, you know? Existing phenomena, like box and cover joining. They fit. They need each other. They function together, box and feather, cover, joining. And according with principle, like arrow points, meeting. This is hard to do, by the way. <laughs> you have to really pay attention when you go like that. Okay. It's like arrow points meeting, you know? So, yeah. So hearing the words understand the meaning don't establish standards of your own so we have a similar thing um in our temple rules when you listen to the zen teacher um what is when you listen to the zen teacher sort of uh, don't don't be checking don't be judging what they're saying so hearing the words understand the meaning what are the words pointing to and don't say to yourself oh that's that's terrible or oh wow i really like that you know just just be open be aware so hearing the words, understand the meaning. Don't establish standards of your own. Don't remove yourself. Don't separate yourself by checking whether this is good or bad, whether you like it or not. Not understanding the way before your eyes. How do you know the path you walk? Good question, right? If you don't understand what's in front of you, if you don't perceive, better word, if you don't perceive what's in front of you, how do you know where you're going? And how will you ever get there? Yeah, I kind of wish that the word understanding was, it was perceiving if, is better because understanding has a little bit of cognition in it, you know? But if you perceive clearly, if you perceive clearly the way before your eyes, if you perceive clearly your direction, you perceive clearly what's around you, then you know the path you're walking on. But if you don't perceive it clearly, then you're confused. You don't know what you're doing. Walking forward is not a matter of far or near. So you go, 
You know the story, you know, you're driving somewhere and the passenger says, are we there yet? (laughs) Are we there yet? Are we there yet? It's that mind that goes, I'm far away. Oh, I'm really close. I'm far away. I'm really close. I'm really, oh no, I'm really far away. You know, that mind that's always checking whether you're far or near, just go forward. Just do it. You know, don't worry about how close you are, how far away you are, and how close or far away you are from what anyway, right? If you are confused, mountains and rivers block your way. You make these mountains, you make these rivers. You know, a long, 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 oh man, well over 50 years ago, um, I was on one of my many acid trips and um, because I was a hippie in Haight-Ashbury living with a dope dealer. And um, I I was walking down the sidewalk and I was stoned off my gourd. And I do not recommend this to anybody. And there was a crack in the sidewalk. And this crack appeared to me (laughs) as a giant ravine. It was like this chasm. I just stopped it in my tracks. I could not cross this crack in the sidewalk, you know? It was just huge. I remember stopping there and thinking, oh, oh, there's this giant ravine and I cannot cross over it, you know? That's, we do that all the time. We do that all the time. We make a mountain. I can't cross this mountain. We make a river. I can't cross this river. So if we are confused, Mountains and rivers block our way. These are the mountains and rivers we make all in our mind because we don't know where we are. So then finally, I respectfully urge you who study the mystery, don't pass your days and nights in vain. Don't space out. Wake up. Whatever you're doing, do it. 100 percent so that's a really very short explication of the sandokai and now we can open for questions or comments well of course i have a question thank Um, you so uh i have chanted this countless times i Mm -hmm. i couldn't even count the number of times Um, and I have two questions, uh, but the first one, which stuck out to me while I was chanting it actually, is when it says each of the myriad things has its merit expressed according to function and place, which you already touched on it, but, um, um, so that, that is the, the saying in this school of correct situation correct function correct relationship something correct relationship yes yes the Um, correct situation correct relationship correct function yeah mm -hmm. um and the myriad things though uh you know i think of myself as being the the one that has the correct um relationship function but but you know you had mentioned your glass and here i have my pen my pencil Mm -hmm. writing my notes Mm -hmm. this has the correct function and and that so so the myriad things are not talking about people it's talking about everything okay like if your pen runs out of ink it no longer has the correct function and then your function is either to get another pen or to fill it with ink depending on what kind of pen it is Okay, yeah. So don't valorize human beings. That's really important. This universe is vast and wide. And we're just a little, 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 tiny, 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 tiny speck of it. Okay? Thank you. And then my other question is at the very beginning, um the the mind of the great sage of india is Mm -hmm. intimately transmitted from west to east so you know if it's if it's such that uh you know everything again not just human but everything Mm -hmm. has buddha nature everything Mm -hmm. has Mm -hmm. everything has 
that which is transmitted. So then how can it be transmitted? I mean, if I already have it. So this transmission, which is, is fuzzy for me, <laughs> which who knows why, some karmic thing, I'm sure. But, but again, if I already have it, how can you transmit it to me? And I guess what, what, why Liz, 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 Liz. What? that's exactly yeah. the point. Yeah. How can it be transmitted? So it's intimate. It's not like I'm handing my phone to my other hand. It's not like that. The metaphor would be the phone is already in both hands. Never got there and never left it. So yeah, so this intimate transmission has no time. It's not like first it's not with Liz and then it's transmitted to Liz. Yeah, you're correct. How can it be transmitted? So transmission is a very, um, very, uh, it's a word. So it's inexact. So, you know, the, the um, Nelson Foster's translation, which I generally like very much, but he says the mind of the great sage of India was intimately transmitted. And I don't like that because okay, I don't like that. But, you know, it, 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 it just doesn't, it seems to miss, I mean, I, I adore Nelson Foster. I know him. He's a wonderful man and a wonderful teacher, but I really disagree. One second, Carrie. I really disagree with his use of the past tense there because it is intimately transmitted. It's not like an object going to an object. It's more like water flowing in a stream. The water just keeps flowing. So this transmission is constant, and there's not a thing to be transmitted. It just keeps going, 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 going. And so your question is, if I already have it, how can it be transmitted is exactly pointing to something very important, where language fails. Okay? So thank you for your insight. And we got Carrie, and then we've got Brad. So Carrie? Well, I wanted to contribute to that discussion because... I would argue that that this is the intimate transmission. We are, it's all this, us interacting, the teaching, us getting to know each other, and the ongoing thing of of um, of of us and practicing. And so. I can tell that you you are or were an academic because I would argue, but you're not arguing. <laughs> just saying something you know but yeah that's right everything is part of this transmission everything is part of this transmission and as i said it's ongoing so sure yeah right yeah let's see brad put it in chat oh brad you know i don't read chinese yeah no that's a nonsense question anyway so um, maybe, maybe i can um ask one that it, it's related to what i put in the chat but in okay. i think you'll be able to answer it more readily. The box uh, metaphor or analogy that's in the poem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a beautiful one. Um, and today, this morning, while I was rereading the poem, I was wondering what, what the box. Yeah, exactly. Is the box. Do you think that the box is meant to be a sensor? Because I read on Wikipedia that the Chinese had sensors for, you know, in BC times is when they started to invent that particular technology for the incense. Oh, that kind of sensor. I thought of somebody like saying, no, you can't publish that. No, <laughs> uh, possibly, possibly. I don't know where the box on its lid comes from. It, it might come from, people might not be familiar with the word. The word, how do you spell it? C-E-N-S-E-R, is that correct? But anyway, there's this word, Sensor, yeah, yeah, I got it right, C-E-N-S-E-R. So this uh, word sensor um, is a kind of uh, thing that you hold the incense in. And like in um, in uh, Eastern Orthodox churches, they put the incense in and then they wave it around and you get these vast clouds of smoke and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, but I don't know if that's what it means. I have no idea what it means, you know, any particular thing. And I don't think it matters. It's the intimacy, the image of you have a box and it has a lid and then the lid exactly fits on the box. 
exactly fits. You know, you can't, you can barely see the line where they fit, but then you can lift the lid. So there's this yeah. intimacy, this intimate, um, well, this intimate fit of, of they belong together. They complete each other. That's what this image is about. Well, how about um, lighting incense as a form of ancestor worship? Because in, in the poem, they're talking about the box. And then in the next line, they introduce that character, Zhang, which basically uh, has the connotations of ancestor worship. So let me find it. Um, where is it? It's toward the end. I, it's kind of like the punchline. If poems have punchlines, that to me seems like the punchline of the poem there. This is interesting. It comes before the foot that I'm having. It's not at the end at all. Um, it's somewhere in the middle. We have the child turning to its mother. How interesting that all of a sudden I can't see it. It's about four fifths of the way through, I'd say. Phenom oh yeah, guessing phenomenally like back box and cover. Yeah, I, w I um, In this translation, yeah. they, they did meaning for mm -hmm. what, what David calls it source ancestral. So, so David, a, you have to tell people who David, David is. Yeah, it's not sorry. David. It's David Hinton who you worship, but yeah, we're not talking about David Hinton here, okay? All right. I know, so, I know. So, okay, so let me say that um, I'm uncomfortable with the phrase ancestor worship, but um, respect for ancestors and um, acknowledging ancestors is very important in ancient China. And the whole notion of lineage chart comes from having to create a family tree for Chan in order for it to be respected in Chinese society. That's why the whole notion of lineage is very important. If you go into like Theravada Buddhism, they don't have this notion of lineage that's very important. I mean, you know who made you a monk or you know who made you a teacher or whatever it is, but they don't have these lineage charts that go back and back and back and back. Okay, so this is a particularly Chinese thing and it's coming out of a Chinese culture is what this, where this is coming from. So there may be some kind of acknowledgement to the imagery, to ancestry, but it's not something to be attached to. It's not the point of this poem. And as I said, I'm really uncomfortable with ancestor worship because that's taking a certain um, sort of uh, monotheistic, you know, sort of, uh, you know, Judaism, uh, Christianity, Islam, taking their kind of notion of, of what worship means where you know you have this God who's separate and he's much bigger than you and you're worshiping him. That's not oh, what it that's is. not that's not what yeah. I meant. So, I said, so I'm I, saying it's it's saying ancestor worship is a really misleading phrase and it shouldn't be used. That's all I'm saying about well, that. But if you're saying well, a, a, acknowledgement of ancestry, well, this starts out with the mind of the great sage of India. So it's starting out by acknowledging ancestry. But the main thing is the dark and the light, the relative and the absolute. The main thing is that. Okay? Make sense? Sure. <laughs> okay. Are there any other comments or questions? Um, I had a question. Some of brothers sure new to this um, when they talk about light and dark is as um, dark as absolute and light is uh, relative mm -hmm. that and if something that is understood in zen does that come from a particular culture could i read that into anything is that specific to the okay song? so so th this is a i'm glad you brought this up because in fact this use of light and dark is in some ways um uh it's it's an it's it goes counter to some of our intuition, right? Because we have, uh, you know, we have this phrase enlightenment and, and or waking up and waking up means you can see 
what's around you. You can see in the light, right? So this light and dark, in this poem, it takes this usage. It's not necessarily universal. It can take the opposite way, too, where the light is is seeing what's there. So you're awake, you're truly awake. And then the darkness is when you're confused. So thank you. And Brad's telling us the Chinese characters. Thank you. Um, but um, that that image is not universal. Just in this poem, it works that way. And it's very important because if you don't know that, then when you read this poem, it seems a little bit strange because it doesn't quite make sense. If you think of light in this terms of awakening or enlightenment, then what's going on here? But if, oh, oh, in this particular poem, the light means that you can see things are separate and the dark means things come together, then it makes more sense. So, okay. And Brad's saying not by definition, but by association. That's not a bad way to put it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the imagery is not universal. So thank you. That's a wonderful question. Are there any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have, I have something. Okay, Shamak, yes. Yeah, it is actually a little bit along the lines of what Joanna asked. I was wondering, like, how she too might have written this poem like these days? Would he still do it uh, in terms of the binary opposites? Or maybe this is more like an answer to the Taoist way of thinking? And, uh, and he's, uh, he's responding to this, this, um, this story of the Northern School and the Southern School. And he says it right in the very beginning. There are no northern or southern ancestors. That's what he's responding to. He's not responding to Taoism. He's responding to this, to this northern versus southern school. No, That's but the Taoism part, then I'm more like, uh, because it seems like it's very binary, like the poem is <laughs> about transcending the opposites at the same time. It's polarizing them a lot in the way he's expressing it, which is not necessarily. He's not talking about transcending the multiple, mm -hmm. saying that the multiple and okay. the one are the same. That's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. He's bringing them together. The absolute and the relative are two sides of the same coin is sometimes okay. happens. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, the question of the influence of Taoism on, on Zen is, um, is a very interesting one, which I'm sure Brad could talk about a lot because he really likes the writings of David Hinton, who says basically that Chan is just Taoism in disguise. Um, my teacher used to say that um, Buddhism and Taoism had a baby and they called it Chan. Um, but, you know, the more I practice, the more this practice feels like Buddhism. I don't know. It's just the, the more I practice, the more it seems to the more attracted I am to sutras and the more interested I am in other forms of Buddhism and um, the less do I feel that, you know, Zen, Chan, Sun is separate from those things. It seems to me to be, you know, really part of this very vast tradition, just one part of it. Carol. Yeah, hi, I'm, I'm hesitant to mention this, but um, Norman Fisher is right now, at, I'm on my phone because my computer's acting up. Sure. Um, Right, Norman Fisher has been teaching the last couple of months on um, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. Yeah, mm -hmm. and and last week, wait, I should tell uh, people this is Shunryo Suzuki's very wonderful, wonderful book on Zen practice. Okay, and last week he mentioned as he was talking about Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, he mentioned the Sandokai. Yes, he did. I don't know if you heard that talk, but anyway, no, but he, he said was, that. Did you hear it? No. Oh, okay, so he was talking, he was referencing a very famous one of the essays in Zen Mind is Beginner Mind, quite a famous one called Nirvana, uh, The Waterfall. Mm -hmm. And and he made a, um, which which was which resonated for me what he was saying, and I just offer this as possible, you know, it just resonated with me. Mm -hmm. the, he, made a, he made a comparison between the Sandokai and the Waterfall essay in Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, that the Waterfall at the top of, like, Suzuki Oishi had gone to Yosemite, and he talked a couple of times in there about it's 1,340 feet big. You know, I mean, he was really, talking, you know, he mentioned that twice. You know? So he, he he was talking about how the darkness, of course, you could look at it at the top of the waterfall. You mentioned the river just now. Mm -hmm. So I thought maybe thought of that. Mm -hmm. um, 
because he, he talks about the river too in this essay, but he, that the waterfall at the top is the, you know, you could say it's like the darkness and then the feelings come as the drops separate, you know, when we have all these feelings that arise in us as, as in phenomena, you know, that as the drops become separate. But as you said, they're both really just expressions of each other. So I know it resonated with me. The waterfall is another image that you could one could use. And That's if all. you, yeah, there are many images you could use. And thank you for mentioning uh, Suzuki Roshi because he has this wonderful book on the Sandokai called "Branching Streams Flow in the Darkness." <laughs> okay, right. yeah, Which is yeah. Fine for the Sandokai, and it is a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, he takes a whole book, you know, I just talked about this, I think it took me like 25 minutes. He takes, you know, many, many lectures, but of course, you know, in each one he goes far afield and then comes back. Um, but yeah, right. Yeah, when I said, when you said Norman Fisher mentioned the Sonic, and the reason I said, of course, what I meant was, well, because that was something that meant a lot to Suzuki and oh, yeah. uh, you know, Suzuki Roshi you know, had this wonderful series of talks on it, which then became this book after he died. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for the image of the waterfall. Yeah. You know, if I were like a standard, if this were like a standard class, I could say, all right, class, you have 10 minutes to come up with another image for the um, identification of the absolute and the relative. And, you know, we've had the box and the lid, we've had the mother and the child, we've had, you know, and, you know, Carol just had the waterfall. Now you have 10, you know, I could do something like that. Um, but I'm not going to do that because then you're going to go right here and that's not a good idea. Okay, Brad, Suzuki book has a nice discussion of dark, oh wait, what are these two characters? You give me these chat characters, I can't read Chinese. So well, in in um, Japanese it's re and g. Oh yeah, yeah. The yeah, the, he talks about light and dark. Yeah, he talks about re and g a lot. Yeah, that that just permeates the whole thing. But that permeates the poem, right? The ab, the the relative and the absolute. That's what this poem is about. Charlie, are you trying to say something? No, oh, because you're pointing. Okay. <laughs> right. I I actually have another question about sure. Maybe. Um, this is like not a, not even really a question about Buddhism, but about mm -hmm. a wider Asian culture and what's mm -hmm. happened in the subsequent thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think that scientists have seized on to the to the re character? I have no idea. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, That's... I'm not an expert in Asian culture. I'm not even an expert in. I wouldn't even know what is my culture. I mean, I, you know, no, I have no idea. Okay. So thank you. Yes, Carrie. Uh, I recently, I, I, uh, there's an eight day retreat in Berkeley every year and mm -hmm. I did that. And, um, and the, uh, Jeff Kitts is the teacher there reads, reads a little something during the last meditation period every Mm -hmm. night. And he read, he read the Sandukai cool. three times, uh -huh. uh, uh, on three different nights. And every time I just kind of, I thought, okay, now I'll, maybe I'll be able to get it this time because it <laughs> and, I, and I didn't, you know, it's, it's just so, so anyway, this is uh, really helpful because, mm -hmm. because, <laughs> you know, every time I heard it, it was like, what is this about? <laughs> and uh, well, I want to apologize, Carrie, because the mind that goes, what is this about is much better than the <laughs> mind that says, oh, now I've got it. <laughs> you know, so this text is like the Heart Sutra. This text, you know, any good Buddhist text, you know, Nagarjuna is Mula Madhyamaka Karika, Fundamental Wisdom of the Middle Way. Any good Buddhist text is about you can dive into it and it's bottomless. I mean, all I gave you was just, you know, some kind of outline of, well, this is what this is referring to and this is what that's referring to. But the text itself is bottomless. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. yeah. And, but and if, you, if, you, if you use this, forget about it because you'll never, it'll never really speak to you. But yeah. 
Right. You know, it's like Liz talked about, you know, she's chanted it like she can't, you know, numberless times. And then she said, in fact, I can't even count them, which is what numberless means. But um, yeah, so, you know, countless times you can't count. But it's like, you know, it's like chanting the heart sutra. It's like these things, they, it's, this, it's just boom, boom, boom. It's like drops of water, drops of water, drops of water, drops of water on a rock, getting deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into that rock. That's the way to look at the sandukha. So I apologize, Carrie. <laughs> I forgive you. <laughs> Thank you. That's great that Jeff that Jeff did that. Did he chant it or did he just speak it? He just read, yeah, just spoke it. Okay, yeah. It's kind of long. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's very cool. Great. Yeah. And you were of course on Zoom. Uh no, I was in Berkeley. You were in Berkeley. Great. Oh, that's really wonderful. Yeah. That's wonderful. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they do eight day retreats in Berkeley, people. Let that be a hint to you. Okay. <laughs> so and the food is really good. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Are, are there any other questions or comments? Uh I have a question, Judy. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, my camera's not working, so Oh, okay. I was trying to see who it was. Oh, this is Frank. No, it's okay. me, Frank. Um I'm curious, have you read a uh, Tibetan Zen discovering a lost tradition? I think it was published by some Shambhala. No, I have not. I was just curious because I feel like it touches on a lot of similar themes to what we talked about, um, you know, coming from the Sandokai. Uh, of course. The union of relative and absolute, mm -hmm. as well as like the whole uh, debate, I guess you could call it between like the gradual approach and the instantaneous approach. Mm -hmm. And I just thought it was interesting because I felt like there were a lot of parallels there. Yeah, well, because we're all human. So absolutely. I mean, this stuff is not limited to Chan, and it's not limited to Chinese traditions as they morph their way through Korea and Japan and make their way into America and Europe. It's not limited. We're all human. And these are very human things. So yeah, there are, there are a lot of... It's not even like there's similarities. It's more like they come from the same source. So we're all cousins. We're all Dharma cousins. So, yeah. So, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people say, oh, Dzogchen and Chan, they're the same. You know, I don't know. But the, these are, there's, there's a common human experience and common human perception that all these, all these traditions are coming from. And, you know, mystical Christianity, mystical Judaism, mystical Islam, indigenous indigenous religions, all these things, they, they come from the same source. So yeah, they will have things in, that you say, oh, wow, that seems very similar. Sure, because they are. So thank you very much for your question. Is there anything else? That's it. Okay, gang, don't pass your days and nights in vain. Deal? <laughs>